Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, uh, what a beautiful uh, day this is. Perfect preaching weather. It's um, cool so that we can concentrate. We appreciate the fellowship that we've been able to enjoy, the good food. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of getting away these days and having a change of pace in our lives. And now as we open your word again, uh, we plead for the presence of your spirit through the ministry of the angels, that you will give us divine enlightenment, and not only enlightenment, but that you will give us the power to live in harmony with the message that we are going to study this afternoon. We plead for your presence. We claim your promise that you will be with us because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, and we are going to read verses 31 through 46. This is um, quite an extensive, long passage but it will be our principal subject of study uh, in our topic this afternoon. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. It reads as follows. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, I want you to notice carefully the details. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with him. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of these, the least my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it unto me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now that's quite a long passage. We are going to dedicate most of our time to taking a look to this passage. We want to ask three questions uh, this morning in our study. Number one, to whom did Jesus address this teaching? Did he address this teaching to believers 
or to unbelievers. The second question is, when and where does this judgment take place? When is the moment that this judgment will occur? Where will it occur? The, the third question is, what is the basis of the judgment? What is taken into account in the judgment? So the three questions, once again, that we're going to attempt to answer is, to whom did Jesus direct these words? Number two, when and where will this judgment take place? And number three, what is the basis of the judgment or what is that which determines the outcome of the judgment? So let's begin by addressing our first question. Is this teaching being addressed to believers or to unbelievers? The answer is that it is directed to believers. And we know that for several reasons. First of all, this parable actually, or this story actually concludes what we find in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. In other words, in Matthew chapter 24, in verses four and five, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he says to his disciples, make sure that no one deceives you speaking to his disciples. And then Jesus describes the signs of his coming. So in other words, those that are in danger of being deceived are not unbelievers, but the disciples of Jesus. So at the beginning of Matthew 24, we clearly see that Matthew 24 is directed to the disciples, to believers. And then at the end of Matthew 24, we have the parable of the good and faithful servant, very clearly directed to those who claim to be servants of Jesus. And then we have next in the first part of chapter 25, the parable of the ten virgins, clearly directed at believers, because they all have lamps. They all have a certain measure of oil. They all claim to be followers of Jesus. And then you have the parable of the talents, very clearly, the parable of the talents is directed to believers, those who have received gifts from Jesus, and some of them multiplied those gifts while the individual who got one talent did not multiply the gift that he was given. So very clearly, at the beginning of Matthew 24, we find that this is being directed to believers, and at the end, the parables also clearly show that this teaching is primarily directed at those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Now, the next question that we want to answer is, when does this judgment scene take place? You know, usually, uh, this passage is applied to the second coming of Christ. But a careful look at this uh, passage indicates that this is not something that is taking place at the second coming of Christ. It is actually a scene that is taking place after the millennium. Now let's look at the characteristics that we find in this passage in Matthew 25 that shows us that this judgment scene that is being described here really is occurring after the thousand years, after the millennium. First of all, you'll notice that there is a white throne, right? A white throne. And uh, there is one who is sitting on this white throne. You notice that this throne is called the throne of Christ's glory. That's a very important detail. So you have a great white throne. Jesus is sitting on this throne and it's called the throne of his glory. And then you notice also that all nations are gathered before the throne. That means that all nations from all history are gathered before that white throne where Jesus is sitting on the throne of his glory. This must mean that people that belong to all nations that died must have resurrected at this point. The wicked must have resurrected. Another evidence is that we have an examination of the evidence. 
And after the millennium, when all nations are gathered before the throne of God, there is an examination of the evidence. The Bible says that the books are opened and they are judged according to what is written in the books. And then we find in this passage that the verdict is given. In other words, uh, the, the judge says these are going to go into the everlasting fire. So you have the sentence or the verdict that is pronounced based on the examination of the evidence. And then you have the execution of the sentence, which is that they are cast into the lake of fire, which has been prepared for whom? For the devil and his angels. Let me ask you, when is it that the devil and his angels are cast into the lake of fire? It is not at the second coming of Jesus. It is after the thousand years. So we have all of these characteristics. We have a great white throne. Jesus is seated on, seated on the throne and it's called the throne of his glory. All nations from all time are gathered before the throne. So that means that the wicked who died must have resurrected. We have an examination of the evidence, a judgment scene where books are opened and the book of life is opened and the wicked see that their name is not in the book of life. And then you have the sentence that is pronounced. Uh, the, actually the judge says these are going to go into everlasting punishment and these will go into everlasting life. And then finally we find that this lake of fire has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Now I want us to notice that there is a similar passage to this one in the book of Revelation. I just alluded to it, but now we're going to take a look at this particular detail. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 9, and verses 11 to 15, we have the same elements that we have in Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 31. First of all, after the millennium, because Revelation 20 is describing events after the millennium, you have a great white throne highly exalted above the holy city. In Great Controversy, page 665, Ellen White describes that glorious throne. And I read from Great Controversy 665. Far above the city, upon a foundation of burnished gold, is a throne high and lifted up. Upon this throne sits the Son of God, and around him are the subjects of his kingdom. You see, this is the throne of his glory. When Jesus ascended to heaven, according to Revelation 3 verse 21, he sat with his Father on his Father's throne. But this throne, Jesus is seated by himself. This is the throne of his glory. And then you read in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 9, that all nations are gathered before the throne, including those who died. Because it says in Revelation 20, verse 5, that the rest of the dead, which refers to the wicked, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So all the wicked from all nations, from all history, are there gathered before this throne. And then you find in Revelation chapter 20 that books are opened. And the wicked that resurrected and the wicked, uh, actually all of them resurrected, now they see the record of their lives, why they were excluded from the holy city. And then you'll find in Revelation 20 that the sentence is pronounced against them. And the devil and his angels and the wicked are cast into the lake of fire. So very clearly in Matthew chapter 25 and Revelation chapter 20 you have the same basic elements. This is describing an event that takes place after the thousand years. Now even though Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation are describing the same judgment the emphasis of Matthew and the emphasis of Revelation is different. The emphasis in the book of Revelation is that those that are outside the holy city are there because they broke God's commandments, because they disobeyed God's holy law. 
Let's read three texts from Revelation chapter 21 and 22 where clearly you find that the wicked that are outside the city that are eventually cast into the fire where the devil and his angels are cast, actually those individuals are cast into the lake of fire because they broke the Ten Commandments, because they were disobedient to God, because they committed sins, if you please. Revelation 21 verse 27 is the first text that we want to look at. Revelation 21 verse 27. Speaking about the holy city, it says, But there shall by no means enter it anything that what? That defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So you notice here that those who defile will not be there. Those who practice abominations will not be there. And those who lie will not be there. These are sins of commission. These are sins that are committed. Notice Revelation chapter 21 and verses 7 and 8. Revelation 21 verses 7 and 8. It says there, speaking first of all about the righteous, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So notice first of all it speaks about the righteous, those who overcome. They are inside the holy city. But now notice verse 8. But the cowardly. Now is, uh, is uh, being a coward a sin? You know the Apostle Paul says in Romans 14, 23, whatever is not of faith is sin. So what is the opposite of be having faith? It's being a coward, right? So it says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, Murderers, what commandment does murderers have to do with? Thou shalt not kill. Sexually immoral, which commandment is that? You shall not commit adultery. Sorcerers, that's really the, the first commandment because sorcerers claim to have divine power to transform reality. And so sorcerers is the first and second commandment. Idolaters is also the second commandment. And all liars, which is thou shalt not bear false witness, shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So why are the wicked cast outside the holy city, city into the fire after the thousand years? Because they committed these grievous sins. Let's notice uh, one more uh, uh, passage in Revelation 22 verses 14 and 15. Revelation 22, verses 14 and 15. And uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Uh, it says, uh, Blessed are those who do His commandments. So who is it that's inside the holy city? Those that do His commandments. So uh, who would be those outside? Well, the ones that don't do them, right? The ones that break the commandments. So it says, Blessed are those who do His commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates, in, gates into the city. But outside are dogs. Dogs are unclean. Dogs defile. And, and once again, there are dogs, sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. So is it clear what kind of people are outside the holy city? They are commandment breakers. They were disobedient to God's commandments. But the emphasis in the book of Matthew is different. In Matthew 25. You see in Matthew 25 we're not dealing with uh, the sins that the wicked committed. In the book of Matthew we have the good that the wicked omitted. In other words, in Revelation, we, the emphasis is the sins of commission, whereas in Matthew, the emphasis is the sin of omission. And you say, now what do you mean by that? Let me read a statement from the book Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 220. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 220. You see, in, um, in Matthew 25, what is the emphasis? The emphasis is that the wicked 
did not feed the hungry. They did not clothe the naked. They did not give water to the thirsty. It's not that they were doing evil, it's that they were not performing good. So there's two sides to the story. There's a sin of commission and there's a sin of omission. Ellen White writes here in Selected Messages, volume one, page 220. The condemning power of the law of God extends not only to the things we do, but to the things we do not do. The condemning power of the law of God does what? Not only condemns the things that we do, which we shouldn't, but it also what? It condemns the things that we don't do or things that we could have done and didn't do. She continues writing, we are not to justify ourselves in omitting to do the things that God requires. We must not only cease to do evil, but we must learn to do well. You know, as Adventists, we're experts in talking about overcoming sin. Yeah, we shouldn't sin. And I agree. We should gain the victory over committing sin. But there's another side to the equation. She continues writing, God has given us powers to be exercised in good works. And if these powers are not put to use, we shall certainly be set down as wicked and slothful servants. We may not have committed grievous sins. Such offenses may not stand registered against us in the book of God. But the fact that our deeds are not recorded as pure, good, elevated, and noble, showing that we have not improved our entrusted talents, places us under condemnation. Quite a statement, isn't it? Now let's look more closely at this passage in Matthew chapter 25. Because the, the, the passage or the text in the book of Revelation are very self-explanatory. You know, people who continue to commit adultery and people who continue killing and people who continue lying, you know, they're going to be outside the holy city because they performed works of sin. They're out there because of what they did. But in Matthew chapter 25, those that are outside the holy city, they are ones who did not do what they were supposed to do with people who were in need. And by the way, in Matthew chapter 25, this is not talking about glorified Adra work. Oh yeah, you know, somebody comes to my door and I give them a loaf of bread. You know, somebody comes and says they're thirsty, I give them a glass of water. That certainly applies, but there's more to the story. There's a spiritual application as well. What does bread represent? The word of God, right? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What does water represent? What does fresh water represent? The rain that falls from heaven, what does that represent? All represents the Holy Spirit. What about that where it says that you took the stranger in? You know, you read Ephesians chapter 2. It speaks of the lost as being strangers to the covenant. That very word that is used. What would the naked be, spiritually speaking? They're devoid of what? What does the garment represent? Christ's righteousness. In other words, we need to take pe to people the message of Christ's righteousness. What about the sick? Is everybody infected with the vir virus of sin? Absolutely, they need healing. What about prisoner? Is the world filled with people that are prisoners to Satan and to sin? Absolutely. So this parable of Jesus is not only describing giving literal water and literal bread and literal garments. It has a spiritual application to taking the message to people to deliver them from spiritual bondage, from spiritual illness, from spiritual nakedness, from being spiritually strangers, from being spiritually thirsty, and from being spiritually hungry. It means practicing practical godliness. You know, some people think that it would be really nice to go to the Holy Land. Excuse the expression, that land ain't holy. <laughs> Ellen White says the curse of God is upon old Jerusalem for rejecting the only begotten Son of God. 
And she says it won't be a holy place until the fires purify it after the millennium. So some people say, oh, if I could just walk where Jesus walked. (laughs) If I could just get in a boat and go across the Sea of Galilee like Jesus did. If I could be baptized in the Jordan River, I would have a deeper spiritual experience with Jesus. Uh -uh. (laughs) Uh-uh. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against educational tours to Israel. I think they're very valuable. What I'm talking about is people thinking that they can go to Israel and they can have a deeper experience with Jesus because they walk where he walked. Notice what Ellen White had to say about this. In Desire of Ages, page 640. Many feel that it would be a great privilege to visit the scenes of Christ's life on earth, to walk where he trod, to look upon the lake beside which he loved to teach, and the hills and valleys on which his eyes so often rested. But we need not go to Nazareth, to Capernaum, or to Bethany in order to walk in the steps of Jesus. We shall find his foot footprints beside the sick bed, in the hovels of poverty, in the crowded alleys of the great city, and in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation. In doing as Jesus did when on earth, we shall walk in his steps. Powerful statement. Practical godliness. You know, sometimes we emphasize so much that we need to quit sinning that we forget that there's another side to the story, not only quitting doing evil, but actually performing the good to those who are perishing in sin. Did you notice in Matthew 25 that the righteous don't really care who gets the credit? You know, the, 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 this story of Jesus, of the judgment, you know, Jesus first comes to the sheep and he says, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was in prison, you visited me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was a stranger, you took me in. And these individuals, you know, they didn't do all of these things because they wanted to get credit or because they want to be saved or because they wanted brownie points. No. They say to Jesus, when did we see you naked? You know, we live in Kenya in the year 2017. You went to heaven in the year 31. How did we see you like that? And then Jesus is going to say, in that you have done it, Unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. See, they did it naturally. They didn't even realize what they were doing. And then you have the goats. Jesus says to the goats, you're going to uh, go to the fires prepared for the devil and his angels. And then he says to them, he doesn't say, because you were murderers and you were adulterers and you were liars, you know, and you were sorcerers, that's why you're going to the lake of fire. Jesus says, no, I was hungry and you didn't give me anything to eat. I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. I was naked, you didn't give me any clothes. I was in prison, you didn't visit me. I was sick and you didn't come to visit me. A stranger, and you didn't take me in. And now those who are outside the holy city will say to Jesus, now wait a minute, you went to heaven in the year 31. We live in Kenya in the year 2017. You know, where were you in 2017? You were in heaven. How did we see you this way? And Jesus is going to say, in that you have not done it unto one of these, the least my brethren. You have not done it unto me. It's the sin of neglect. We will be held responsible not only for the sins that we commit, but for the good that we neglect to do in blessing people who desperately need deliverance by Jesus Christ. Now, I want to invite us to go to Matthew chapter 19 and verses 16 to 22, pursuing this thought about the need not only to cease doing evil, but to do good. This is the story of the rich young ruler. Matthew 19 and verse 16. 
Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher. You can see that he wants to impress Jesus, right? Good teacher. What good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? So he says, I, I know I need to do something, so, so what do I need to do to have eternal life? Remember that. This young man wants eternal life, and he's asking Jesus what he needs to do. Verse 17. So he said, Jesus says to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, what kind of life? What, would the, what does the context say? If you want to have eternal life, is what Jesus is saying, keep the commandments. Huh. Now when this young man hears this, he says, Oh, goody, goody, I'm going to heaven for sure. <coughs> Was he, was he a moral person? Yes. He was a good Jew. Do you think he returned his tithe? Yes. Oh yeah, the mint, the dill, and the cumin. Do you think that he, that, that he worked on Sabbath? No. no, no, no. Do you think that he ate pork? No. no. He was morally righteous. So Jesus says, keep the commandments. He says, this is too good to be true. But then he wonders, he says, well, maybe there's more to the story than what I realize. So he says, which ones? <laughs> and Jesus says, well, uh, and, and Jesus actually quotes the last six commandments. But, uh, but if you're careful in reading, you're going to notice that Jesus took out one and put in another in its place. He took out the commandment that says, you shall not covet and instead he put you shall love your neighbor as yourself because loving your neighbor as yourself is the opposite of covetousness it's the positive way of saying do not covet so let's continue reading in verse 18 he said to him which ones Jesus said you shall not murder you shall not commit adultery you shall not steal you shall not bear false witness honor your father and your mother and you shall love your neighbor as yourself Oh, the young man, he says, yeah, just what I thought. You know, keeping the commandments is going to get me there. <laughs> Verse 20. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. But then he asked, what more do I still lack? <laughs> Jesus says, well, you're a commandment keeper, yeah. You haven't killed anyone. You haven't been unfaithful to your wife. You know, you, you, you're a Sabbath keeper. Yeah, very strict. Yeah, okay. But there's another side to the equation. This is the, the side that is mentioned by Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, Jesus had said, If you want to enter life. Now Jesus says, If you want to be what? perfect go sell what you have and give to the poor is that similar to Matthew 25 absolutely give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me huh but when the young man heard that saying he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions what was the sin of this young man? Was it the sin of commission or was it the sin of omission? omission? The sin of omission. And by the way, he committed the same sin as the rich man in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You know, the rich man represents the Jews and Lazarus represents the Gentiles. You'll notice that in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you know, the rich man didn't kick Lazarus. You know, he allowed Lazarus to stay at the foot of the table to eat the crumbs that fell from the table. So he didn't mistreat him. He just did not provide for him. And he ended up where he thought Lazarus was going to end up, in the fire. Now let's go also to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and let's begin reading at verse 38. This is a long passage, but... 
uh, it has a relationship to what we're talking about. Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 38. You have heard that it was said, this, this is Jesus speaking, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Is that the way most people live? Yeah. You punch me in the nose and I'll punch you in the nose and, some, and in the gut. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. That's difficult, isn't it? Somebody slaps you, you say, thank you very much. Slap me on the other one. Verse 40, if anyone wants to sue you, take him to court. No. It says, if anybody wants to sue you and take away your tunic, you say, don't you want my coat also? The religion of Jesus isn't quite easy, is it? And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to whomever asks you. And from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, notice that Jesus doesn't say, don't hate your enemies. The religion of Jesus is an active religion. He says, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. In other words, Jesus isn't saying that if somebody curses you, oh, you bite your tongue and you don't say anything. No. He says, if somebody curses you, say, God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. Wow. Continue saying, do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Is the religion of Jesus a do religion? Or is it only a stop doing bad religion? <laughs> it's a do religion. Notice, these are imperatives in the original language. He says, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, how many of us believe that we are sons and daughters of God? Raise your hand if you believe we're sons and daughters of God. Uh, well, most everybody raise their hand. Are you sure? Let's read the next word in verse 45. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. What is the condition for being sons and daughters of our Father in heaven? Loving your enemies, blessing those who curse you, doing good to those who hate you, and praying for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. What if God was like us? God says, there's this farmer over here. He's a good Seventh-day Adventist. He will have rain and he will have sunshine. This farmer over here, he's an atheist. Sorry, no rain and no sunshine. <laughs> you see, God not only asks us to do these things, God does them first. And so it says in verse 45 that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. And then he says, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do you love your parents? Do you love your relatives? Do you love your friends? Do atheists love their parents? Do they love their friends? So if you love your parents and your friends and your relatives, what more do you have than the atheist? That's what Jesus is saying. If you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do the so? And now notice the conclusion. Remember this conclusion. We're going, to, we're going to come back to it. Remember what Jesus said to the rich young ruler? If you want to be what? If you want to be perfect. By the way, the emphasis there, no, is, is not that Jesus is saying, you know, keep the commandments and you're going to be perfect. It's the other side of the equation, isn't it? See, sometimes people get this last verse of Matthew chapter 5 wrong 
They, when, when it says here in verse 48, therefore you shall be perfect, just as your heavenly father is perfect, they say, oh, you need to quit sinning so that you're perfect. And I believe that we need to overcome sin. But that's not the emphasis here. The emphasis is not quit committing adultery and quit lying and quit cheating and quit, quit uh, uh, making money your God. That's not the emphasis. The emphasis here is in the positive side of religion. Doing as Jesus did. So notice the conclusion. Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What is perfection? This is one side of perfection. Is perfection only ceasing to do evil, or is perfection also performing the good? It's performing the good. Perfection has two sides. Now let's go to a parallel passage. In Luke 6, 27 to 36, it's the same teaching of Jesus. But I want you to notice that the conclusion is different. Luke 6, verse 27 to verse 36. It's beautiful to hear the pages of the Bible turning. It's a symphony. We should be a people of the book. You know, pastors like two noises in church. And one of them is not the cell phone. <laughs> we love to hear the pages of the Bible turning. And we love to hear an amen at least once in a while. Because <laughs> it shows if you're, if you're with uh, the preacher. So he says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Is this the same teaching that we read in Matthew? Matthew 5? Yes. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone to ask of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do unto you, you also do likewise to them. But if you love those who love you, uh, those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Is this the same passage? Same teaching? But the conclusion is different. Let's notice what perfection is. It says, once again, in verse 35, But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, as your Father also is merciful. What does it mean to be perfect? It means to be what? Merciful when you compare the passages in both Gospels. Now I want to end by going to one final story. The story of the Good Samaritan. By the way, we call this the parable of the Good Samaritan. This was a true life story. In fact, Ellen White explains in Desire of Ages <laughs> that the priest and the Levite who passed by this uh, individual that fell into the hands of thieves were present listening to Jesus tell the story. <laughs> you can imagine their surprise thinking wow was this guy there watching us <laughs> he wasn't the Holy Spirit revealed it to him so let's go to this story in Luke chapter 10 and verse 25 through verse 37 Luke 10 25 to 37 once again it's the other side of perfection what I call the other side of perfection one side is ceasing to do evil yes gaining the victory over sin Yes, not breaking God's commandments. That's definitely one side of perfection. But the other side is performing the good. Doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Luke 10 verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer. By the way, when it says a lawyer, it's talking not about a secular lawyer who takes cases to present before a secular court. It's talking about uh, an individual who is an expert in the law of Moses. Okay, so this is a religious lawyer. 
So a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Is that the same question that the rich young ruler asked? Yes? yes. Absolutely. So how many, how many ways are there to get everlasting life? Three, four, five? Or is there only one way? One. There's only one way. So in this story, we must find the same answer of Jesus that he gave to the rich young ruler. Right? So... He says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? You tell me. You're the expert. You have a PhD in theology. You tell me. So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You know, those are the two great commandments that summarize the Ten Commandments. The first four focus on God, and the last six focus on our fellow human beings. So this individual uh, answers the question correctly because in verse 28, it says uh, uh, concerning Jesus, and he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. <clears throat> what side of perfection are we dealing with? The positive side. Do. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love Jesus. But this, uh, this lawyer, you know, he found himself between a rock and a hard place because he wasn't doing what he was preaching. And so Jesus says to him, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, his, his sin of neglect, <laughs> the sin of omission, not loving his neighbor as himself. He asks, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the story. Verse 30. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And believe me, that is down. <laughs> you know, Jerusalem can have snow and Jericho can have uh, pretty se semi-tropical weather on the same day. It's a torturous road that, that goes down, down, down across the Judean desert. And, um, you know, it's very desolate. You know, once in a while you'll find a few uh, Bedouins with their beasts, but, uh, but it's very, very desolate. So you can understand how he fell into the hands of thieves. So it says, once again, um, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Now, who is the thief of thieves? Because this is, a, this is a real story, but it's a parable also. Who is the thief of thieves? Satan. Satan. It says in John 10 that he doesn't come but to what? But to steal. So the thief in this story, the thieves are the devil and his angels. Who stripped him of his clothing. What does clothing represent? Did, did Satan strip, strip human beings of their righteousness? He most certainly did. And it continues saying, wounded him. Is, is humanity wounded today? You better believe humanity is wounded. Who wounded them? Satan. And so it says, he departed, leaving him half dead. Is humanity half dead at the point of death? Absolutely. Now what would have happened if nobody had come from outside to help this individual? He would have died. He needed outside help. And so here comes verse 31. Now by chance a certain priest, this is the pastor, okay? The pastor is the most guilty. A certain priest came down that road. When, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He comes down the road. He doesn't come, even come close. You know, he comes down the road. He passes on the other side. Who knows what excuse he used? Maybe he thought, well, maybe the thieves are still around. I better get out of here. Or maybe he said, you know, I have my priestly robes on and, and I just don't want to get them all stained with blood. Or I'm, I'm in a hurry because I have to get to the service in the temple. I don't know what excuse he gave. But he saw this man in need and he continued on the way. He continues saying in verse 32, Likewise a Levite. I like to think that the Levite are the church members. When he arrived at the place, now notice he's a little bit better because he comes and looks. He just doesn't go straight by. He comes and looks. 
and pass by on the other side. But now notice a Samaritan comes. Was a Samaritan from a different country? Was, from, was he from outside? He was an outsider? Yes. Was Jesus an outsider who came to this earth to help us? Yes. Absolutely. So it says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had what? Compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. What does oil represent? And what does wine represent? The blood of Christ. What are the two healing agencies that heal humanity? The blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the life. So it says he pours on them oil and wine and set him on his animal and brought him to an inn. Now he's taking him to the hospital. What is the hospital? The church. <laughs> where does God put, where does God put um, sinners that be, have begun the healing process? He puts them in contact with what? With the church. And that's where the healing is completed. And so it says he brought him to an inn and took care of him. Now I want you to notice that there's going to be a second coming of the Samaritan in the story. On the next day when he departed, so the Samaritan left, but he left the person at the inn so that the healing process would be completed. So it says he departed, he took two denarii. When Jesus left this world, did he leave gifts to the church? Did he leave resources to the church to bring healing? Absolutely. So he gave him two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, most likely the pastor, and said to him, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. <laughs> Jesus says, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give according to every man's work. So there's a second coming of the Samaritan. And he says to the innkeeper, you take care of him. You make sure that he gets well. <laughs> because when I come, I will repay you. And then verse 36. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do thou likewise. Go and follow the example of Jesus is what this is saying. So what side of perfection is this dealing with? Not ceasing to do evil, but doing good. Every time that we find someone who is in need, in need of spiritual help, in need of physical help, whether it be spiritual food or physical food, whether it be spiritual clothing or, or physical clothing, whether it be literal water or spiritual water, whether they be literally in prison or prisoners to sin, it is our duty and our responsibility to care for those people, to reach out to those people, to love them, and to provide for them. That's what I call the other side of perfection. I want to end by reading one final verse. James 1 verse 27 has the two sides of perfection in this one verse. James 1 verse 27. both sides pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this now comes the definition of pure and undefiled religion to visit orphans and widows in their trouble what side of perfection is that that's the Matthew 25 side right to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and now comes the other side, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Those are the two sides of perfection. And you know what? When we're performing the good, the bad takes care of itself. When we are about the Father's business, we have no time for the devil's business. Because we're too busy doing the Lord's business. You know, but sometimes we fight against sin. We say, well, I've got to overcome this sin. I've got to overcome that sin. Whereas if we were active in showing the love of Jesus, 
sin would take care of itself in our lives. Amen. So we've come to this convention to be inspired to go out and witness for the Lord and bless those who are in great need. You know, uh, I've heard that in Kenya, perhaps you have what, uh, half a million members? Is that an accurate number? How many? 1.8 million? How many, how, what's the population in Kenya? Four, 45 million? The professor knows. 14 and a half million. So how many more people do we have to reach with the love of Jesus? The job appears overwhelming. You know, when I look, when I look at this world that soon will have 10 billion people, I think, how are we ever going to finish this? You know, we baptize a thousand in an evangelistic meeting and, you know, we, we say, praise the Lord. And, and, and there's reason to praise the Lord. But what is, it, what is a thousand compared with 48 million? But I praise God that there's a promise in the Bible that God's going to pour out His Holy Spirit. Amen. Without reservation. In its fullness upon those who have committed themselves to Jesus Christ. To performing the work of Jesus Christ. And then miraculous things will happen. Thousands upon thousands will come into the church as a result of our witness. And I know that all of us have come here because we want to be that kind of person. We want to witness. In fact, I want to ask you as we end, do you want to be that kind of witness? Yes. Do you want to stand if you want to be that kind of witness? I'm going to have a word of prayer that the Lord will empower all of those who are here, all of us who are here, not only to overcome evil, but to perform the good through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. What a glorious privilege it is to belong to your people. But there are so many out there that are lost. Not only lost, but miserable in the process. You have called us to reach these individuals who are suffering in so many different ways economically, in terms of family, illness, and so many other ways. You have called us to reveal the love of Jesus to these individuals so that they can have hope of a better life. I ask, Lord, that you will bless all of those who are gathered here. We want to commit our lives without reservation to you and to your beloved son, Jesus. We want to receive the outpouring of your Holy Spirit so that many thousands and perhaps even millions will embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We long for that day and that's the reason we're here. I ask Lord that you will hear our prayer, that you will answer it because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus our Lord and Savior. Amen.